Well, good morning, everyone. W welcome to church this morning. It's uh, great to see you here. Um, trust others will join us in a few moments uh, time. And we hang on to the promise of the Lord Jesus that he's with his people uh, this morning as, as we meet together. Welcome to those of you who are watching online. Uh, um, just a little word for those who do watch online. Um, I did mention a few weeks back um, about the new sound and vision system. Continue to be patient. Hopefully by the end of this month we should, should be sorted. There's just a slight uh, delay in, in timings on that. Uh, for the week ahead, uh, notices tomorrow morning um, will be the warm spaces coffee morning uh, here from 9.30 until uh, 12 noon. On Tuesday, the prayer time is the uh, local United uh, prayer meeting at Shepherd Drive uh, Baptist Church at 7.30. Wednesday, the community cafe from 10 o'clock uh, as normal. And Wednesday evening is the men's group, the, the forged uh, group, where you'll be having um, a film night here at uh, 7.30. Um, any uh, queries on that, have a word with Carl, and I'm sure he'll be able to answer that uh, for you. Thursday will be Life Group, and that's at Sarah's Homes at 7.30, 7.30 on Thursday for those who are uh, involved uh, in that. And next Sunday service, normal time, 10.30 a.m., uh, morning worship, which will be led by pastor and includes communion next Sunday morning. Uh, our members for prayer uh, this week are Tony and Bev uh, Jolly and Joanne Kimani. So remember, those are members in prayer. On the notice board at the back, there is um, a list about the church lunch that we're having on the 26th of March. encourage you to stay to that if you can do after the morning service. Um, there is... Uh, we need the names on there. Costs are four pound per person or ten pound per family. The menu is up there, and thank you, Angela, uh, for that. Minced beef cobbler, and then you have a choice of dessert, which you need to mark on the board: lemon meringue or pear upside down cake. So that all sounds very good and uh, enticing there. So have a look at the board and add your name if you would like to come. We do thank those of you who continue to give to the food bank to find. Um, if you're not aware, there is a box in the foyer, the far end of the foyer there, where we collect uh, for find and encourage you to uh, give food gifts there, which we can take over uh, to the depot of find in Ipswich. We also want to thank you for the gifts over the last couple of Sundays to the um, Turkey-Syria earthquake appeal uh, through Open Doors, which amounted to 278. So we'll be sending that off to Open Doors to help with the Christians in the churches there, particularly in northern Syria, as I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> and then for those of you who haven't uh, heard the news, our dear friend, brother, church member, and father-in-law to me, uh, Eric, went home to be with the Lord uh, yes, yesterday uh, morning. As a family, we do want to thank you very much for your support and, and, and prayers uh, during uh, the last week. Many of you, I guess, only knew Eric in latter years because they moved to Ipswich uh, to be near us. But Eric lived a, a lifetime of serving his Lord. He was 93 and he was converted at Cambridge University and immediately changed his degree course to study theology and went into the ministry. And he served his whole career in the ministry, initially in the Anglican Church and then in Free Evangelical and uh, three or four Baptist churches, I think it was, uh, around the country until he retired. Eric was a great writer as well. Um, he had many books published, including commentaries on the Psalms and Proverbs, many Christian books. So God used him in many ways. And now he's gone to his heavenly home and his eternal reward. And we're thankful for that hope which we have. Thank you for your thoughts and prayers. Over to you, brother. Thank you. 
Isaiah 40, 6 to 8. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. We live in a world of changing. Many of the changes we see uh, in the world currently aren't necessarily good changes. And it can get very, very unsettled. And yet we rejoice in the fact that though we change, we get older and our bodies wither. The reality is our God doesn't change. He is a constant. His faithfulness remains. So we're going to stand and sing together that wonderful hymn by Thomas Chisholm. Great is thy faithfulness. take your seats. Our legacies often can be greater than we can ever imagine. And in fact, Margaret's playing here today is because Eric, or George, as I discovered this week, 
um, insisted that she practice, as I'm sure she did with Judy too, that, that voice of crying out, have you practiced yet? Ensuring that the children reach the standard by which they can bless the church and his influence continues. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we live in a world of fashion that's often fleeting fashion, fashion that's here today and yet tomorrow is blown away as the new fashions become the norm. And Father, we thank you that you are not a God of shifting shadows. You're not a God that's changeable. You're not a God that loves us one day but doesn't like us the next. You're not a God who is displayed in this universe as a changeable, capricious type dictator. But you are a constant. That we're told, Father God, that you are love, and that love is constant. But you are holy, and that holiness is perfect and remaining. That you are a God who's there for us, who's our refuge and strength. And that strength is dependable. So when we wake up, on a good day, we know it's there. When we wake up on a bad day, we know it's there. Because, Father God, you are unchanging. You are faithful. You are good. And, Father, we pray as we come to this week when we acknowledge Eric's passing yesterday. We thank you, Father, that we know a God who is faithful because we know, Lord, that Eric is now with you. But this is not the buffers of his life. It is not the end of Eric's life. It hasn't come to an end, but in one sense, in a glorious way, it's just beginning. In a wonderful way, the, the true life of the saint, the true existence that C.S. Lewis describes of moving from the world of shadows to the world of reality has happened. And we thank you, Father God, that we, who trust in you, will look forward to seeing Eric again and all those who have gone before, because, Father, you are a constant, because you are a faithful God, because you keep your promises, because you've overcome sin and death, because, Father God, you are an eternal God, and you promise us eternal life through your Son, Jesus. So, Father, amidst the pain of separation and of saying farewell, we pray especially for, for Joyce, for Judy, for Margaret, and all the wider family, for Kate, for all the wider family, that they may experience such a sense of your presence and of those everlasting arms under them during the days and weeks ahead. Lord, may you be to them the faithful God you are. May you cause them to soar on wings of eagles on the promises of Scripture, your eternal word. May you be, Lord, their joy and their sustenance, their refuge, and their help in the days ahead. And Father, we pray that you may help each one of us here to carry that resurrection hope in our lives, not as a distant promise, not as a maybe, not as an apple pie in the sky kind of theology, but as a Christian reality, because you are a faithful God, because you don't lie, you don't give false hope. Lord, you promise, and your promises are your word, and your word is true, because you are faithful God. Father, just help each one of us here to realize just what that means, that it may put such a bounce into our lives, such a, such a sense of joy in knowing you, Father God, our faithful one. So be with us now, we pray, Lord, as we gather in this church. Be with those people who are gathering online, both now and later on during the week. We ask, Lord, that this whole service may be done to your glory. That you may be lifted up in our worship and praise. And you may build us up as Christians to make us more faithful. Make us better disciples. More able to follow you closely. And to see and to be the blessing that you need us to be. Lord, make it so because we gather in this place in the name of Jesus, who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now I could invite Louise and Richard to come and talk to us about some excitement later on in the year. Yeah, hi everyone. Okay, the first weekend in September, okay, book that in your diary now, okay, that's Friday the 1st of September to Sunday the 3rd, we're at Sizewall Hall Church Weekend, okay. So hands up if you have not been to Sizewall Hall before. Okay, uh, all right. Excellent, just, just two of you. So, um, yeah, Sizewell Hall's a, a Christian conference centre. Uh, it's a bit like a hotel uh, with space to eat and space to worship together. It's fantastic. Um, going on, so I'm Louise, um, going on retreat is a biblical idea. So um, I'm just going to read a little passage from Mark chapter 6, um, starting at verse 30. And this is, Jesus had gathered his disciples together and he'd been teaching them and showing them to, how to minister. And then he sent them out in twos and they had a, had a go. And then they were coming back together and having like a, um, telling him. And it, so he's starting at verse 30 in Mark chapter 6. The apostles, the disciples, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place to rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. So yeah, it's similar to these disciples they were busy 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 doing in the world and like us we're all in the world where God has put us doing our bit busy busy and people coming and going and sometimes you might not even have time to have, sit down and properly eat and things like that so Jesus says come let's go off to a quiet place rest eat and be alone with Jesus so yeah that's that's why we do it basically yeah, there's um, another connection with that passage, actually. In that passage, Jesus was in a boat, so he was in the sea. And Sizewell Hall is um, right on the cliff tops, right overlooking the sea. So that's, that's just um, fantastic. Um, the speaker this year is um, uh, a legend from Stoke-on-Trent, uh, John Mason. So the former pastor here, uh, most of you will know. Um, yeah, he's going to be giving us all the talks for the weekend. So, can I hold that one? Yep. So look out for the letter and the booking form. Um, the, there'll be some on the door, hard copies, but you should be getting them by, if you get it by email, you'll get one by email. And um, it'd be really, really helpful if you could get this book form back as soon as you can. The deadline's at the end of April, but if you could get it back. And the person to get it to um, is Angela Dan. I'll just, if she could give us a wave. Angela's also going to be doing the food at Sizewell Hall, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, um, all the costs are in the letter. Okay. And um, day visitors are welcome too. So if you don't want to stay overnight, uh, that's fine. And um, we just want everybody to come. Um, with the cost of living crisis and, and cost, um, if you think, I'd love to go, but I can't quite stretch to it. 
Um, have a word with Robin, okay, or have a look in the letter. Everything's in the letter. Um, but the main thing is we just want everybody to come away for the church weekend, the family church weekend together. Yeah. So, yeah, first weekend, September. <coughs> So make sure you get that in your diaries. First week in September for this, the, this year's 2023 Sizewell Hall uh, WBC conference. Thank you, Richard and Louise. We're going to sing a couple of songs now. We're going to sing, first of all, Bless the Lord, and then it's rising up. Thank you.
So, I wonder if any of you boys and girls would like to come down the front and sit on the occupier front seats down here. Be brave. Don't be bashful. I've only got a few. There's a few more sitting in the back, but that's it, that's it. If you're embarrassed being down the front, remember I do this every Sunday. So... <laughs> Okay, right, so we're going, to, we're going to tell a children's story. Um, but before we tell the children's story, okay, there's, what, what's the thing we always do before I tell you a children's story? Can you remember? Go on, Peter, yeah? Um, was it, um, uh, good, good answer. We're doing that later on, not sword drill. It's a good answer. Before I do a children's talk, it involves a pocket on your anatomy. Yes, you remember now? Imagination cream, okay, good. So we're going to get the imagination cream in a second, um, okay. Um, in fact, we'll do that first of all. Get your imagination cream out. So go to the, find somewhere in your anatomy. You'll find you should find a pocket, like, and you should get a little box, uh, box looking like that. Can be a tub. Sometimes it's a little bottle. Depends what type you've got, what year you've got. Okay, and get hold of the imagination cream. Put it in your opposite hand to your right hand, under the lid. Put it somewhere safe. Okay, and get some of this cream out. Okay, come on, mums and dads and older people, get with the program. Don't be bashful. This is church. Okay. Okay, that's the idea. Okay. Get the lid, put it on nice and tight, and put it back in your pocket. Don't spill imagination cream on your carpet, or Robin will be very cross with me, okay? Imagination cream takes a long time to get out the carpet. Okay, right, got imagination cream. That helps you imagine, because I'm going to tell you a story in a minute that re requires lots of imagination. But before we do that, I need to warn you that there's actually a name that I'll be mentioning during the story, a name that Trevor absolutely loves, okay? And every time I mention the name, you've got to do a response, okay? And the name is the hooded nose. 
Thank you, bro. There we are. There's he. <laughs> Chev's known of this series a long, long time ago. He is a man who has um, a slightly large proboscis on the front of his face, and every time I mention the word, the hooded nose, you say... You do, but you say it with more enthusiasm. You say, oh, no, not the hooded nose. Okay, let's try again, okay? Every time I want you in the word, the hooded nose, you say, oh, no, not the hooded nose. Jolly good, now we're getting there. Good, okay, lovely. Have my slides up, please. Thank you. Right. Because I want to tell you a story. Herbert Humphreys was an ordinary sort of bloke, about five foot eight, eleven stone in weight, and well, well proportioned around the middle. And it was an ordinary sort of day for an ordinary sort of bloke. And Herbert was busily concentrating on his job as a road sweeper around the streets of London. Back and forth went his brush, grating over the tarmac, grating over the pavements, sweeping up all the litter and the mess that's made by the people in that large metropolis. Yet at the very moment, something was happening that would make his job so much harder. High above London, flying his own super jet with its, sluts, with its sneeze propulsion system was the hooded nose. Oh, no, not the nose. And what was worse, he was up to his usual tricks, putting his nose in where it wasn't wanted. <coughs> As he flew high above the city, in his snows, in his uh, a uh, sneeze propulsion jet, he began dropping on London a leaflet called Hit or Be Hit by Dr. Big Nose. This should cause a stir. <laughs> he laughed. As the leaflets gentle fluttered down on the pavements, the people of the city began to pick up these leaflets and read them, and this is what they read. Life is all about the survival of the fittest. Dog eat dog and all that. So if you want to get on, stick the boot in, wall up your neighbour and succeed, signed Dr. Big Nose. And as the people began to read this leaflet, this small, insignificant note, as they began to read this leaflet, a strange thing began to happen. The people began to do just that. All over the city, the people began to hit and to kick and to wallop each other. Give me this, they shouted. Give me that. Take this, they screamed. And take that. Now at this moment, Herbert came across a lot of the leaflets lying on the road. Holy waste paper baskets, he shouted. Who made this mess? He stooped down and picked up one of the tracks and he began to read. It said, life is about the survival of the fittest. Dog eat dog and all that. So if you want to get on in life, stick the boot in, wallop your neighbour and succeed. Signed, Dr. Big Nose. What a load of rubbish. Herbert thought to himself. And just then he saw a lady running down the street towards him. Oh, it's, it's awful, it's also awful, said the, said the lady to Herbert. It was the mayoress, mayoress of London. What's the matter, Your Honour? Herbert asked her. What's the matter? What's the matter? Can't you see all the mess? This is an uproar, uproar, I tell you. That dreadful man, the hooded nose. Try to keep up, please. Let's pollute our city with this, this terrible, horrible pamphlet. Tell everyone just to fight, to behave like animals. Oh, it's ghastly, so ghastly. So that's what this, all this is about, said Herbert. Don't worry, Your Honour, I can clear up this mess. Oh, no, said the mayoress. It's not the mess in the streets I'm worried about. It's the mess this, this, this thinking's making in people's heads, in their minds. I know what you mean, Your Honour, he said Herbert. And he reached down into his shoulder bag and reached for a hot flask of hot water. He poured some into a cup and then added some to a powder in a packet marked soup. He then said to Mary's, excuse me, Your Honour, I need to change. Really, she retorted. Oh, this is no time for a tea break. Oh, oh, oh this is horrible. Even the, even the street, street cleaners have gone mad. And she went off in a half. But uh, Herbert ignored her and he began to drink his soup. There was a flash of light. There was a puff of smoke, and when the puff of smoke disappeared, there stood before them Superman, the man of soup, the people's hero, defender of crime, uh, defender of the weak and helpless, fighter of crime and evil, a man who, whenever he drank soup, became supercharged and superpowered. Now to clear up this mess, shouted Superman, 
and he launched himself high into the sky, clutching one of his brooms. He spotted a dust cart, and using his broom and the dust cart under, the, under his arm, he went through the streets of London, street by street, road by road, alley by alley, sweeping as much litter and rubbish from the hooded nose as he could, putting them into the cart, and got another cart, filling another cart, and another cart, until eventually the whole streets of London were clear of that horrible leaflet by Dr. Big News. But the terrible thing was, having swept up all the rubbish, he looked around the streets and people were still fighting. People were still doing what Dr. Big Nose had suggested. They were standing there fighting in the streets. Give me this, give me that. Take this, take that, they said. Holy, holy minds, holy ties, he said. This rubbish has got into people's thinking. I must do something about it. And so he rushed along to Trafalgar Square, where the fighting was the loudest, and he began to get in between people as they were trying to fight. But still the fighting continued. The shouting carried on. People began still carried on kicking and punching each other. And Superman tried to get between them to stop them. And eventually they stopped fighting each other. And they thought, who are you, Superman? I want to fight. Let's fight him. And they began to make Superman the target of their punches and of their abuse. Superman stood there. He took it. He could have got rid of all of them. He was super-powered. He was Superman. He could have got rid of every single one of them and put them away. But he didn't. He stood there and took it. Until eventually, horribly beaten, he was taken to King's Cross Hospital to be dealt with by the doctors. The mayor is sat by his bed all night. The people stopped their fighting because they suddenly realized as they looked at the beaten and bruised body of Superman, they began to realize the madness of the leaflet by Dr. Big Nose. All night, the people sat in the square waiting for news about Superman, laying critically ill in hospital. And on the Sunday morning, the mayoress got up and she said, people of London, you'll be pleased to know that Superman is alive, but not that you deserve any good news. He's alive and we're back on our streets helping keeping us safe from evil and from the work of the hooded nose. So stop your fighting, hurting each other, and put that horrible booklet by that man out of your minds and think of Superman instead. Don't think of bad thoughts about each other, but think of our hero who suffered so much to save our city. And with that, the people returned to their homes, and they burned all the copies of Hit and But Be Hit. They tried instead to focus not on the booklet by Dr. Big Nose, but they tried to put pictures of Superman where his words had been. More about that later on. Go back to your seats, please, thank you. And we're now going to have a song, which is Behold Our God. Thank you.
sinful man God eternal humble to the grave Jesus Savior is a slides up please thank you so Peter was right we do do soil drill we can do some soil drill now we've been doing some memory verses for the last few months with how many did anyone know how many memory verses we've done so far which number this is anyone have any idea if I say it's less than half a dozen sorry five Today's the fifth one. Well done, well done, Matt. That's good. Today's the fifth one. So, right, who can tell me? Can anyone remember the very first one we did? Sword Rule One. Anyone remember? Anyone have any idea? Yes, go on, Peter. Okay, go on, let, me get, let me get the uh, microphone. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is steadfast on him because he trusts in you. Brilliant. Thank you. Well done. Let's have a look. Well done. Excellent. Well done. Brilliant. Isaiah 26 verse 3. Brilliant. Lovely. What about number 2? Anyone can remember number 2? I'll give you a quick flash. Oh, there we are. All scripture is God breathed. Remember that one? Yes. Peter again. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> okay. All scripture is God breathed and is good for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so the um, man or warrior of God um, can be thoroughly equipped for. That's Every good. good deed. That's well done. Every good. Brilliant. Well done. Well done. Excellent. Right. Okay. Drill three. There we are. That was an easy one. Galatians. Remember this one. Galatians five. The fruit of the spirit. Anyone know this one? Anyone know this one? I'd hope some of the adults would know this one. But okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> Peter again. There we go. Gone. <laughs> the fruits Sorry. of the spirit are love, joy, peace patience, kindness, gentleness, um, um, self-goodness, self faithfulness, self and self-control. That's right, well done. Yes, there is no law. That's right, well done. Okay, Galatians, oh, this is the, the chapter, uh, chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. Brilliant. What about the last one we did? Saw so drill 4. Jesus said, this one's a really, give it a quick, there we are. Okay. So I hope an adult would know this one. In fact, there could be a big clue on the wall behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Louise, you're going to do this one, are you? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 8, verse 12. That's right. Well done. Oh, so I've gone wrong way. So I've gone wrong way there. John 8, verse 12. Well done. Excellent. I am the light of the world. Brilliant. And this Sunday, we missed one last, last, uh, last time because we had a very full service and we couldn't do it. So in uh, number five, we're looking at another verse, and the verse is this one here. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, 
today and forever. Now, this is a competition. There's going to be a really special prize for the, uh, for all the children take part, there'll be prizes, but it'll be a special prize for the overall winner um, uh, at, the at the end of what we'll be doing this next, uh, up until the end of this year. Um, so we, we are wanting people to be able to recite all 12 verses, and these verses are all going to be very, very important. And this is another important verse for this day and age and for us as Christian warriors. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. So we're going to try it. It's a very easy one, isn't it? It's not hard at all. So we'll do it, first of all, by saying this three times. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And that's Hebrews 13 verse 8. Let's say it all the way through. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13 verse 8. Well done. Brilliant. Okay. So we're now going to have our reading. And our reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13 to 15 and 22 to 25. Under the title of Be Holy, Peter writes this. He says, Therefore, with minds but alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. And then verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withered and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. May God bless to us that reading of his holy word. Thank you, Jeff. Here are my second slides, please. Thank you. A song that many of you, well, those of you among the older members of the congregation may remember. I'm not busy. That's it. A bit louder, Trev. They seek him here. They seek him there. His clothes are loud, but never square. It will make or break him, so he's got to buy the best. Cause he's a dedicated follower of fashion. And when he does, his little rounds round the boutiques of London town. Eagerly pursuing all the latest fads and trends. Cause he's a dedicated follower of fashion. Oh yes he is. Oh yes he is. Oh yes he is. Oh yes he is. Thinks he is a flower to be looked at. Oh, 
dedicated followers of fashion, but in some way we all are, because we live in ages that are fashioned by the thinking and the teaching and the, um, the mood of the society in which we live. And when I was reflecting on this, uh, on this um, Sunday and, 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 and what to talk about and, 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 and what we're to bring, I really sense that fashion is something we need to really address and to realize that God isn't fashionable. God isn't fashionable. He is a constant. And that's an important thing to just remember. Now, many of you here, I mean, many, some of you are younger than me, some of you are older than me, will remember two very significant decades in the last 60 years that I've been on planet Earth. And two of the most fashionable and most influential decades were, first of all, this decade here, the 70s. And 70s was a, a really in, interesting period because it was reacting to the 60s as the 80s reacted to the 70s. And of course, everyone knows um, that the 60s was the flower power period, the period, the, the, the fashion of free love. And, 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 and it, as we came into the 70s, a lot of the influences from the hippie era were very much in the fashion because people like this couple, who's this couple? John Lennon, yes, they were the fashionable hipsters in, in America. They represented the hippie movement. And you saw that in the way they dressed and the way that they behaved. So there was the hippie influence in the 70s. There was the glam rock influence. David Bowie, or Zizi, Zizi Stardust, as, he's, as his stage name was at that stage. You know, the autonomous glam rock influence of that area. Um, was very much part, he was one of the leading lights in that, was David Bowie. And then this lady, anyone know who this lady was? Susie Sue, Susie Sue that's right, from Susie, and if I very quick there, we <laughs> see your influences came from. Okay, Susie Sue, Susie and the Banshees, again, very heavily influential in the 70s. And the, she again was reacting, you know, against the bright colours of the 70s, by the black stuff that she wore. And she actually was a big influence behind the goth movement that began to come out in the 80s and the 90s. Fashion. Anyone think of two influential films of that period, 1970s? Anyone remember who this lady is? What the, what, Annie Hall, that's right. I mean, look at the way she's dressed there. She represents New York chic, you know. A men's shirt, tie, waistcoat, loose-fitting trousers. She always seems to be dressed as a bit of a mess. But she was very hipster. She was very New York cool in the 1970s in that very famous film, Annie Hall. Another very famous film of that era represented the hippie era. Hippie era. Love story, that's right, yes. Okay, and, you know, Annie McCraw, she wears very much long flowing, colourful, or, or long flowing hippie type dresses as she meets um, her, her husband-to-be, Ryan O'Neill. Again, two very influential films. And you can see this in the colours. These are the colours from the 70s. Uh, you've got the very bright colours. You've got the influence of the hip, hippie movement here in the early, early 70s. Remember this suit here, the trouser suit? Yes, or they called it the pantsuit in America. It's a very strange name, but yeah, the trouser suit. Anyone remember these? Bell bottoms. Everyone associates the 70s with bell bottoms. It's so much more than bell bottoms. Who remember this? Croquet tops. Remember, remember tank tops? Yeah, I used to have a couple of tank tops. Hideous colours. 
get, get, used to be my Christmas present for several years in the 70s. Hideous, hideous tank tops that my mum thought it was fashionable for me to wear. Hot pants. Who remembers those? And 70s cool, as particularly seen, is the footwear of the 70s. Look how fashionable those shoes are. I can remember almost killing myself going at school wearing a pair of shoes like that. Well, not exactly shoes like that, but men's platform shoes. Fully down, <laughs> fully down. <laughs> yes. don't, don't get worried now, okay? <laughs> they, they, were, they were definitely very much boys' platform shoes, but fully down the stairs because I couldn't walk in these horrendous shoes. The only time in my life I've ever felt tall, I was ever anywhere close to being as tall as my brother. Even, even now, he, he, he hangs above me up in, the, up in the gods there in the corner. <laughs> and look at this. Glam rock, anyone, anyone know these bands? Far left, Slade, that's right. And the right, Queen, yeah. The bottom, and again, you've got Slade again. And you've got uh, David Bowie in the right. Look at his shoes there, fantastic. I'm not sure who that, that lady is on the left hand side. Anyone know? I couldn't work out who she was. Anyway. And, but everyone associates the 70s with flares, but it was far more than just 70s. Huge influences that you come into the 1980s and suddenly, remember the 1980s? It was an exact rejection of everything hippie. So the first fashion in the 1980s, anyone think what that, what that was? Such a direct opposition to the hippie movement? It was that. Punk, it was punk. It was punk, people going around with punked up hair, they had chains, uh, you know, going from their lips to their ears. They even appeared during the, during the 80s when to reject the colourfulness and, and, and the exuberance of the hippie influence in the 70s, people used to even wear bags of sick around their neck. That was a, a thing for a while, a punk thing, because punk was, uh, was actually against anything of the hippie movement and, and also against the materialism of the 1970s and coming into the 80s. It was a kind of folk rebellion, as seen here with all, oh, sorry, all these different styles. I and mean, then in the midst, midst of the 1980s, we had a resurgence of this, this movement. Who knows what that movement is? Skinheads, that's right. It came out in the, with the mods in the 60s, fighting against the, um, the bikers, the rockers, okay. And we had a resurgence of this during the 80s, the skinhead movement. Very fashionable Ben Sherman and uh, t-shirts and that kind of thing. And then we had suddenly a real break in the middle of that. And we had the New Romantics. And we had this character here, one of the lead people for New Romantics. Who was this? Adamant, that's right, yes. Adamant, okay. Okay, really introducing this kind of really bizarre fashion trend going back to the so-called romantic era. So wearing lots of very period dating dress. Okay, Stand and Deliver be one of the first of the hits in that, in that particular period. And there's someone else who was a new romantic, came from a, a band called Bow Wow Wow, formed his own band called Culture Club, was this man here. Boy George, yeah, that's right. As you see, all, all the influences of the uh, new romantics there, the new wave, as it was called. So it was all about fashion. And fashion is usually influence, and fashion comes through different influences. It comes through music, like we've seen then. It also comes through TV, through series like this. Oh, sorry, I would say it, it was summed up by big hair. A lot of really big hair in the 1980s. Um, Really, really <laughs> big hair. And of course, big hair with people like this. Who's that? Madonna, that's right. She was very much in the early, uh, early 80s were about big hair and had huge influences upon our young, young females especially about fashion. Um, so it's all about big, um, big, big hair and, 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 and flamboyant dress. And then we have programs like this. Remember this one? Dallas, well done, okay. There was Dallas and the other famous one that went alongside it was this one here. Okay, Dynasty, that's right. And they influenced fashion because they talked about power dressing. And it, suddenly it became very fashionable to, for women to have suits, but the distinctive thing about those suits or anything they wore was the shoulders. Remember that? 
big, big shoulder pads, power dressing, and big, big shoulder pads. Actually, it's been a res- bit of a resurgence. When I, was, when, I was, when I was trying a bit of preparing this, I, um, I was looking at fashion generally across the whole of the globe, and I discovered in, 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 the, in the, um, the Paris fashion show in last year, big shoulder pads have come back in again, as you'll see here. I'm not sure how it's, 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 how, how it's ever going to catch on, uh, but the worst actually was Samuel, Sam, Sam Smith's example at the Brits this year. Um, and that's how Sam Smith turned up at the Brits this year. So you see, big shoulder pads are, are, are very, very much in. I must confess, if I see him walking down the sh- shop, I'd be reaching in my pocket to try and find a pin somewhere to kind of, but that, that would be naughty, I shouldn't do that. Um, but fashion, how fashion influences our society. And it doesn't just influence the way you dress, it influences how you think. It really influences how you think. Because all of us, in some way or other, have you know, succumbed to fashion. I know when I was in school, you know, fashion was the big Windsor tie knot. And I used to have my big school tie, the big knot, uh, as, hard, as hard, big as possible. And because, actually, I had these on my feet, Dr. Martin boots that were very fashionable during the 80s. It was the only footwear that my mum would let me wear that wasn't Clark's. My mum was a big into Clark's. Every year we went down to Clark's shoes, and, you know, and Clark's always you know, were equated when I was a kid as boring, um, but good, good quality, boring quality. Um, uh, and I had to wear Clark's shoes. All, the, all of us in the family had to. And then mum discovered that Dr. Martin's were quite reasonably well made, and I was allowed to wear Dr. Martin boots. And then later on, these came into fashion. What are these? Sorry? Nike, Ni- yeah, Nike um, b- baseball boots became the fashionable uh, trainers. I have to say, I was, quite, I was, I was obviously leading the fashion because I was wearing these in the late 70s um, before they were fashionable, but that's just, uh, that's just, that's just an off chance. I don't know how I, I've never really been fashionable in my life. But the point is, is that fashion does influence us. It influences how we think and what we do. And fashion itself is not wrong, you know. It's okay to dress up if you want to and follow a fashion, as long as that fashion does not contradict the Word of God. It doesn't come to tell us that we have to believe or act differently to what the Bible says. And that's the danger of fashion, especially in the way people think and ideas. We read this. It's interesting that some fashions come into their own. This was also in 1980. 85 exactly. Anyone know who that is? Clive Sinclair. And the Sinclair, Sinclair C5. He called it a recumbent tricycle. He wouldn't call it an electric car. He called it an electric vehicle. And, um, and he launched it in 1985. And tragically, it never really caught on. But now, up and down the streets, up and down the pavements, we were down in Christchurch, uh, park yesterday and there was a young young man rushing around the, the park on an electric scooter and of course electric cars and electric vehicles are all the rage because suddenly Clive Sinclair's idea has come into its own the fashion has finally become a fashion in our day but how do we deal with fashion the Bible tells us that the source of the Bible isn't in man It's not in fashion, it's in the mind of God. So the Bible says all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for correcting, teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible actually comes from the mouth of God. And when God speaks, he doesn't speak lies, he speaks truth. And God in himself is unfashionable in the sense that he doesn't change. He is the same. What he says is the same. 1 Peter 1, 13-16 says this, Therefore with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace that has to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to you at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you have when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is, is holy, so be holy in all you do, For it's written, be holy, because I am holy. 
Anyone know what the word holiness means? Sorry? Separate, yes, okay. Set apart. set apart, yeah, set apart. In essence, it means to be different. And God is holy, which means God is actually without fault. He is pure. He is right. There's no error in God. So God is holy, and if God was to cease to be holy, he would cease to be God. He would cease to be right. When you're holy, when you're right and perfect, the only way, well, there's no way up because you're the highest you can get. The only movement has to be down. When you are truth, the only change you can make if you're true is to be untrue. The nature of God is holy. He is different. And where to be like God, holy and different. And the Bible reinforces this time and time again that God is an unchanging God. Malachi 3, verse 6, God says, I, the Lord, do not change. Numbers 23, verse 19, God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. God is a constant. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is above, from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God is not fashionable, not because he's uncool, but because he's unchanging. He is a constant. And that's really good news, isn't it? Because you know when you wake up in the morning, God hasn't changed his mind about you or about things the night before. You know, one of the difficulties in, in life is things are changing all the time. You know, remember, you know, the, my, the, my first ever car, I love that car. You know, I used to clean it all the time. You know, and you look at my Mini outside now and it's filthy dirty because, you know, I've got used to having cars. They're not as important as they was when I was a young guy. But my young, my, my first time my car, I, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a I've told you this before, it's an Austin Allegro. I had no idea about cars. I, <laughs> I knew lots about motorbikes, nothing about cars. I had this Austin Allegro. But, I, you know, it was, I love that Austin Allegro. My first ever car, got it in Germany, tax-free, and I had a vinyl roof put onto it, you know. Who has vinyl roofs on cars now? But I went into Kent and had a, a vinyl roof put on my car, a black vinyl roof, so it was blue and black. And I loved that car. But after a few years, I realized it wasn't fashionable to drive around in Austin Allegro. It wasn't even fashionable when I bought it. <laughs> I just didn't realize it, okay. And I got rid of it. I got rid of it. You know, sometimes when we wake up and we, and we look at ourselves and suddenly realize that our clothes perhaps aren't quite as fashionable as others are, or our house is an is unfashionable color, you know, we get influenced by this. But the great thing is, is God does not change. He is the same. He is not fashionable. He is perfect. Jesus is Christ. is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as Christians, we're not called to be fashionable. And in this day and age, we're becoming unfashionable because we can't affirm and live by the fashions of our generation, about gender. We can't live by, you know, about sexuality. And people often say, you're old-fashioned. But the great thing is, we're not old-fashioned. We're living by the God who doesn't change. God isn't old-fashioned. He never has been. He never will be. God is truth. And if you don't live by truth, you end up living by untruth. Don't be ashamed of worshipping the living God. Don't be ashamed of being called old-fashioned because you're trying to live a holy life. Don't be ashamed of being a Christian in this day and age because our God doesn't change. His words, we're told, are eternal. Don't be ashamed of standing up and nailing your colors to the mask because we're called to live like our God. Our God's a holy God and we're called to be holy people. And Dr. Big Nose, oh, I didn't mention his name, I said Dr. Big Nose, <laughs> who's always trying to stick his nose in, tries to stick his nose into our minds as the way we think. Tell him to do one. And try to live by our holy God, whose ways are perfect and all his ways are just. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's stick with the truth and stick with the God who doesn't change. 
and live by him to his glory in this world in which we live. Amen. We're going to sing a lovely song by Brian Dorickson. It's Faithful One, So Unchanging. Let's stand together. changing and changing all your beauty and all your glory and all your goodness father help us to mirror you in our lives help us to try and get rid of that canker and that rubbish in our lives and help us father to have minds that are set upon you lord by your spirit change us to reflect your light your beauty and your truth that we may bring love to this world that so dearly needs it in the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit. Lord, go with us, help us now, each one, to become more like you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go and, and have teas and coffee and fellowship next door, please take a seat a second. While we celebrate a God that's unchanging, the reality for all of us is the, the time of life marches on. And this week, on Wednesday, we have someone who will be celebrating their 60th birthday. And that's the embarrassing red man sitting next to Val in the back, Paul. 
and we've got a cake for him that Sandy has wonderfully made. I'm about to sing Happy Birthday. Stand up, Paul, we've got to embarrass you even further. <laughs> Uh, happy birthday. It's Julie Frost's birthday today. Oh, is it? Oh, okay, thank you. To you. Happy birthday, dear Paul. Happy birthday to you. Well done, thank you. Oh, and I've also been told it's Judy Frost's birthday, so, but it's, it's, no, she's now very embarrassed, okay? It's, it's, this wasn't planned. Let's sing Ju happy birthday to Julie as well. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Julie. Happy birthday to you. Now, please stay for yeah, yeah, cakes. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, this is this is yours, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, oh, I'll put it. There we are. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. That's brilliant. So, uh, should, should we put it over there for me? That's up. That's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> 